Thanks for keeping your dials on Channel 1 TV. We're crossing over to the Ministry of Finance where they are having a meeting with the IMF on Ghana's third tranche of the IMF funds. Percentage points of GDP last year, which is quite remarkable. It is set to improve by another one percentage point this year, with Ghana posting a primary balance surplus. In other words, revenue will exceed non percentage for the first time in almost a decade. This has been achieved by mobilizing additional domestic revenue and by streamlining and improving the efficiency of public spending. Crucially, these interventions are accompanied by efforts to protect the vulnerable who are most affected during adjustment programs. For example, the 2024 budget has continued to increase benefits under the existing targeted cash transfer program, the Living Empowerment Against Poverty program. It also boosted allocations toward the school uh, feeding and other key programs. To foster durable fiscal consolidation and increase resilience against shocks, ambitious structural reforms are being implemented. And these reforms span tax policy, revenue management, public financial management, and are also addressing inefficiencies in the energy and cocoa sector. The government has made significant headways in its debt restructuring strategy. Most recently, the government's agreement with Ghana's official creditor committee under the G20 Common Framework on a memorandum of understanding formalizing the agreement in principle reached last January was a key milestone. And so was the agreement in principle reached with representatives of Eurobond holders. The Bank of Ghana has kept a prudent monetary policy stance, helping push inflation down. It has also taken steps to rebuild Ghana's international reserves. Additionally, the authority's economic reform program includes measures to ensure financial stability and to make the environment more conducive to private investment and job creation. Overall, performance under the MF supported program has been generally strong. Ghana has met all quantitative performance criteria and almost all the indicative targets, and good progress was made on key structural milestones. All of these efforts are yielding positive results. Signs of economic stabilization are emerging. For example, economic growth has proven more resilient than initially envisaged. Therefore, we are revising our growth projection up from 2.8 to 3.1% for 2024. Inflation is declining rapidly from 54% in December 2022 to 23% in May 2024. And Ghana's international reserves have been increasing. Looking ahead, staying the course by adhering to the committed policy and reform agenda remains essential to fully restore macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability, especially in the context of the upcoming general elections. We welcome the commitment from Minister Adam and various other government officials to stay the course on reforms. Let me end by reiterating the IMF's unwavering commitment to continue supporting Ghana. The completion of the second review marks another important milestone in the journey to recovery and towards building a flourishing economy that uplifts every Ghanaian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was so inspiring. We, we picked a lot from it. I'm, I'm most excited about the fact that the growth uh, projection has been revised upward. That's good news for Ghana. It, it means more revenue, more opportunities for the country, especially our young people. On that note, we will move to Dr. Ernest Addison from the Bank of Ghana. Governor, if you are ready, we will take your comments. Thank you very much, Madam Minister of Information, Honorable Abubakar, uh, Honorable Minister of Finance, Mohammed Amin Adam, and thank you to Stefan. Let me start by saying that the Guardian authorities have made unprecedented efforts to address macroeconomic imbalances. Today, the macroeconomic outlook is dramatically improving and there are clear signs of economic stabilization. Growth is surprising on the upside. Inflation has fallen significantly. Fiscal policy is consolidating and foreign exchange reserve buildup has been robust. First and foremost, on inflation, 
we saw the trajectory in 2023 with a sharp fall from 54 percent at the end of 2022 to 23 at the end of 2023. This was achieved with very effective monetary policy operations, which were very costly to the balance sheet of the central bank, but very necessary for the public good. The pace of disinflation, however, has not kept up in the first four months of 2024 and has only begun to fall significantly at the end of May. We expect this to continue through till the end of the year under the tight monetary and fiscal policies, stable exchange rates, and the expectation of improved food supply during the harvest season. A key determining factor will be the behavior of the exchange rate. The improving economic fundamentals, the strong accumulation of foreign exchange reserves under the Gold for Reserve program, and the agreement with the OCC and sovereign bondholders on debt restructuring should all in concert provide the basis for stability in the exchange rate going forward. With a successful conclusion of the second review, we need to begin to think of the third review of the program and beyond and take advantage of the reform momentum. Steadfastness and commitment will be needed from now to the end of the year to see through all the structural reforms envisaged under the program, including the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Ghana on the recapitalization of the central bank. This will strengthen the central bank's credibility to effectively deliver on its reforms. I must at this point mentioned that on a year-to-date basis, that is as of June 27th, the Bank of Ghana had accumulated foreign exchange reserves to the tune of $907 million, nearly double what we have in the IMF program targets. The bank will continue to work closely with the commercial banks to ensure that they are well capitalized to deliver on their mandate to support growth. Plans to recapitalize banks are being implemented also to strengthen financial stability. Most of the banks are ahead of their recapitalization plans. And we are confident that the sector will continue to remain sound liquid and profitable. To conclude, inflation is still high at 23.1 percent relative to our end of year target of 15 plus or minus 2 percent, despite the sharp improvement. And the rest of the year will be challenging, but we will remain resolute working with the Ministry of Finance and the IMF to ensure that the improving outlook is sustained. We want to thank all stakeholders who have worked with us collaboratively to get us to this point. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Addison, Governor of the Bank of Ghana. Uh, once again, today we are hearing only good news. Uh, the governor mentioned that they have doubled the reserves and now we have to the tune of 907 million dollars that's that's good to know and he's also outlined the measures that they've put in place to address the currency uh, challenges so i'm so excited that we have these developments honorable minister we'll turn to you and and pick your initial remarks before we pick some questions from the media present.
colleague, honorable ministers, governor of the Bank of Ghana, deputy governors, IMF mission chief for Ghana, Stefan Rode, the resident representative, um, chief director of the Ministry of Finance, GRA commissioner general and other commissioners, directors and technical team of the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Ghana, distinguished media friends, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to share with you once again a brief update on the state of our nation's economy and the progress we've made in the implementation of our IMF-supported post-COVID-19 program for economic growth, PCPEG. We had scheduled to address you, ladies and gentlemen, on Saturday as part of the monthly briefing on the state of the economy. But well, we could not do that, and then two days later, we're having a joint conference with the IMF. And so we will take this joint conference, press conference, as June updates as well. First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to the people of Ghana for their resilience and support in these challenging times. The good news is that the implementation of the policies, measures, and interventions which we developed to address the economic challenges facing our dear nation are yielding positive results. Despite a challenging global environment, the strong leadership provided by His Excellency President Nana Adodanko Akufuado and his government, coupled with support and inputs of the people of Ghana, have undoubtedly contributed to the successes we are seeing today. It is our conviction that in the near term, we will see even greater results as we ramp up our implementation efforts. In today's media briefing on the economy, I'll provide updates on the following key areas. The performance of the economy to date, progress made on the implementation of the IMF-supported PCPEC, status of Ghana's debt restructuring program, and the status of independent power producers' legacy debt, as well as the power purchase agreement renegotiations, among others. Let me summarize some of the remarkable achievements we've witnessed in recent times. Generally, the macroeconomic environment continues to remain stable as government continues to implement the IMF-supported program. Growth, as we've heard from the previous two distinguished speakers, is proving to be more resilient and robust than initially programmed. And the economy continues to show strong signs of recovery, particularly in quarter one of 2024. The results was remarkable. Overall, real GDP growth for quarter one 2024 was 4.7%, the highest since quarter one of 2022. This growth performance is better than the 3.1% growth recorded in the same period in 2023. Industry grew the most at 6.8%, followed by agriculture at 4.1%, and services at 3.3%. The 2024 quarter one GDP growth rate is the highest since quarter four of 2020. The growth in industry is particularly interesting. In the past, Growth came largely from services and to some extent agriculture. Industry did not perform well. And so if we are beginning to see industry performing well, it tells us that the real recovery is here. Manufacturing is going to grow continuously and that will mean more jobs being created for the Ghanaian people, more wealth being created for the Ghanaian people. And therefore, we have turned the corner as we have said over and over. The future is brighter. Inflation 
as we've also heard from the governor of the Bank of Ghana, is declining with a strong disinflation process since the beginning of 2023. In response to the ongoing fiscal consolidation, appropriate tightening of monetary policy, and relative stability in the exchange rate. Headline inflation declined by 1.9 percentage points to 23.1 percent in May 2024 from 25.0 percent in April 2024, after peaking at 54.1 percent in December 2022. The city has been under pressure in recent times. However, compared to 2023, we've seen relative stability. Year-to-date depreciation of the city against the dollar is 18.4%, compared to 22% recorded in the same period in 2023. The key measures we are implementing to deal with the recent depreciation include, as we heard earlier, tight monetary policy by the Bank of Ghana, deepening the ongoing fiscal consolidation program, intensifying gold for oil program, and the Bank of Ghana's gold for reserves program, anticipated forex inflows from disbursements from our multilateral and bilateral institutions, as well as private sector financial institutions. This include the IMF third tranche of $360 million which will be disbursed to Ghana by close of business today, Monday, 1st July 2024, following the IMF Executive Board approval of the second review last Friday. The IMF fourth tranche of another 360 million US dollars expected in quarter four of 2024 after IMF Executive Board approves the third review. The World Bank DPO, that is for development uh, policy operation too, tranche of $300 million expected in quarter three of 2024, and disbursements from bilateral institutions and financial institutions, including the World Bank Gary project of $150 million, EBIT facility of $200 million for SME support, and anticipated proceeds from the 2024-2025 Cocoa Board syndication of up to $1.5 billion in quarter four of 2024. We have said over and over that the problems with the city can also largely be attributed to uh, speculation. And therefore, whilst we'll be making effort to influence market sentiments positively, we also know that some other people are inciting speculation. We have had intelligence that people have been deliberately inciting speculation but we never got it too real as we saw only two or three days ago when my good friend and my brother, the Honorable Adongo, went out there urging people to buy dollars to do their business. And this was after I indicated at the town hall meeting in London that with all the policies we are implementing, with the flows that we are expecting from external sources and with the completion of our restructuring, the debt restructuring with our bilateral uh, official creditors as well as our Eurobond uh, holders, we saw the city becoming stronger and stronger. My brother went out there to say that people should ignore Amin Adam and go out there and buy dollars to do their business. I think that this is not healthy for our economy. We all need to work together, whether we are with the government or we are with the minority, because we are all stakeholders in this economy. We have a duty to our people to ensure that the economy is stronger for the benefit of all. And so, my friends, on the minority side, I want to appeal to you to stop inciting speculation and to work with us, give us constructive uh, criticism, give us ideas so that we can complement the ideas we are already pursuing, so we can provide the kind of direction our people uh, expect of us. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have heard that gross international reserves is improving 
and the external balances continue to improve. The gross international reserve improved to cover three months of import as at April 2024, up from 2.7 months in December 2023. The trade and current balances remain positive. Interest rates are falling, with the 91-day Treasury bill rate presently at 25.7 percent, down from 29.4 percent at the end of 2023. The fiscal consolidation program is progressing smoothly, as Ghana's primary fiscal balance improved by over four percentage points of GDP in 2023. And we are committed to further improve the primary balance to a surplus of 0.5% of GDP by the end of this year, and 1.5% of GDP in the 2025-2028 period. The fiscal efforts are supported by reforms to enhance revenue mobilization and streamline non-priority expenditures, whilst expanding social protection programs to mitigate the impact of fiscal adjustment on the poor. After successfully securing a staff level agreement under the second review of the IMF supported program in April 2024, the IMF Executive Board approved the second review of Ghana's program last Friday 28th June 2024, and this has just been confirmed by the IMF Mission Chief Stephen, uh, St Stephen Rode. We therefore expect the fund to disburse the third tranche of $360 million by close of business today, Monday, 1st July 2024, bringing total disbursement so far to $1.6 billion United States dollars. We have also, ladies and gentlemen, finally reach agreement with independent power producers to restructure legacy areas and PPAs, power purchase agreements, after six years or so of negotiations. This will certainly provide some fiscal relief and savings over the life of the power purchase agreements, as well as guarantee a more reliable supply of power. Following the completion of domestic debt restructuring, of about 203.4 billion Ghana cities in 2023, we reached agreement with the Official Creditor Committee under the G20 Common Framework on 11 June 2024 to restructure Ghana's official bilateral loans totaling $5.1 billion with an estimated debt service relief of $2.8 billion between 2023 and 2026. We also reached agreement with our bondholders, euro bondholders, on the 19th of June 2024 to restructure euro bonds amounting to $13.1 billion with a debt cancellation of $4.7 billion and debt service savings from 2023 to 2026 of $4.4 billion. The rate of accumulation of public debt is therefore declining following the good progress we have made in our debt restructuring effort and the success of the fiscal consolidation program. Additionally, key structural reforms to support growth and improve the PFM system, improve revenue mobilization, and support sound monetary and exchange policy are beginning to yield positive results. Let me now give you some further details on the implementation of the IMF supported program. Ladies and gentlemen, the second review mission by the IMF staff, as I indicated earlier, was successfully concluded on the 13th of April 2024, enabling Ghana to reach a staff level agreement on the review. The IMF has acknowledged Ghana's strong performance, as we heard from Stefan Rode. The mission chief for Ghana, who has worked tirelessly with us to come this far in the achievements that we have made under the program. Ghana's performance under the program has been generally strong, with all the quantitative performance criteria for the second review and almost all the indicative targets met. The structural reforms executed under the second review include the following. We expanded gift mix infrastructure to cover 280 
IGF reliant institutions with all the available functionalities in December 2023. We published on PURC's website the final report of the first quarterly audit of ECG's single account in February 2024. The Bank of Ghana in March 2024 took the requisite action against banks that did not comply with the wanted recapitalization and the non-negative car requirements in 2023. The Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of Finance designed and began the implementation of a credible, comprehensive, and cost-effective plan that seeks to address NIB's insolvency challenges by end 2024 with approval from Cabinet. We also developed and Cabinet approved a centralized inventory of all ongoing and planned investment, public investment projects in March 2024. And also, Cabinet has approved proposed amendments to the Bank of Ghana Act aimed at addressing the challenges uh, highlighted by the IMF safeguard assessment to strengthen Bank of Ghana's autonomy. We are committed, ladies and gentlemen, to sustaining our macroeconomic policy adjustment and reforms to fully, fully restore macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability, while fostering a sustainable increase in economic growth and poverty reduction. Despite the fact that 2024 is an election year, we are committed to enhancing domestic revenue mobilization and tightening expenditure commitment controls to avoid policy slippages. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to also report significant progress in our debt restructuring efforts, which began in 2022. Our debt exchange offers have resulted in a substantial reduction of our debt burden and an extension of our repayment period when the agreements we have reached are implemented. On the domestic front, the domestic debt exchange program, which involved the restructuring of some 203.4 billion Ghana cities of our domestic debt was successfully completed in September 2023 with an overall participation rate of about 95%. That was remarkable participation. And so on behalf of His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, I would like to use this opportunity to once again express our sincere appreciation and gratitude to all Ghanaians for your continued support and sacrifices, which contributed significantly to the success of the domestic restructuring program. Ladies and gentlemen, you may also recall that Ghana announced a debt standstill on 19 December 2022 as part of the external debt restructuring process. We had earlier, on the 13th of December 2022, requested from the Paris Club for DRG 20 Common Framework for debt treatments beyond the debt service suspension initiative. Later, on the 10th of January 2024, Ghana, Ghana formally requested for debt relief through the G20 Common Framework for debt treatment. The size of the OCC, OCC meaning official, um, official creditors, the OCC debt to be restructured at the end of 2022 was $5.1 billion, with OCC eventually agreeing on a cut-off date of 31st December 2022 for the debt restructuring. Following several months of negotiations, we reached an agreement on the terms of the MOU with our official bilateral creditors on the 11th of June, 2024. The MOU will serve as the guiding document for the amendment of all claims by individual countries. We are currently in the implementation stage of the MOU with the expectation that each bilateral creditor will have separate agreement to implement the MOU signed with the OCC. And this we expect to be done within the next few months. With the MOU now agreed upon, it is expected that our official bilateral creditors will resume disbursements 
on projects that stalled as a result of the debt standstill, but within the agreed fiscal terms. The restructuring of our official bilateral loans, as we have reported earlier, will lead to debt service relief of $2.8 billion between 2023-2026. That means $2.8 billion that we would have paid between 2023 and 2026 is being rescheduled to be paid at a later date at relatively cheaper interest. Ladies and gentlemen, let me also report on the progress we have made in our restructuring negotiation with our Eurobond holders. After several rounds of negotiations on proposals and counter-proposals, we reached agreement on both the financial and non-financial terms on 19 June 2024. We successfully negotiated a 37% nominal principal haircut, equivalent to a 45% market value loss to euro bond holders, with no contingent compensation mechanism as seen in the Zambia and Sri Lanka cases. The debt cancellation involved is $4.7 billion, and debt service savings from 2023 to 2026 is $4.4 billion. This achievement is significant, given the ambitious timeline and the fact that it is the highest and the fastest agreement reached under the common framework since its inception in 2020. The time from public announcement of an intention to restructure to when an agreement in principle is reached for Ghana was 18 months. Compared to 30 months for Mozambique, 30 months for Suriname, 20 months for Chad, and for Sri Lanka, uh, it continues ongoing for two years and two months so far. This landmark achievement demonstrates the confidence in our country's leadership and administration's ability to steer economic recovery, marking the first instance in recent memory where a debt restructuring has been both requested and concluded by the same administration. The IMF has already confirmed that the terms of the agreement are consistent with program parameters. The OCC Secretariat has also assessed the terms and confirmed that the agreement in principle provides a solid basis for consultation with its members for collective assessment of the comparability of treatment principles. The next steps is to prepare for the launch of the consent solicitation and the exchange memorandum on the international capital market, which we expect to commence in July this month and conclude by September 2024. We remain committed to engaging and, and resolving our non-bonded commercial indebtedness as well. So while the restructuring process has been challenging, we deliberately chose to implement an economic reset, recognizing that starting anew in the post-COVID-19 pandemic and global inflation era will provide Ghana with the best opportunity to achieve sustainable growth and development. The government's significant economic policy measures, including strong fiscal consolidation and structural reforms, were key to re-establishing trust with creditors in Ghana's commitment to maintaining fiscal discipline leading to the credibility of our debt restructuring efforts. We acknowledge the support of bilateral and multilateral partners, including the OCC, the IMF, and the World Bank, who provided financial assistance and facilitated the restructuring process. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many unique features of Ghana's Euro bond debt restructuring. Number one, it was completed in record time demonstrating our commitment to efficiency and swift action. Number two, it marks the first time that an international debt restructuring is commenced and completed by the same administration, demonstrating our dedication to seeing our commitments through fruition. And number three, we avoided complex contingent instruments, but instead negotiated a simple plain vanilla terms also reflecting our commitment to secondary market trading, transparency, and simplicity. 
if we had negotiated contingent instruments, that would have meant that any time the economy improves, we'll have to pay more coupons. And therefore, by negotiating a simple, plain vanilla terms, we avoided the contingent instrument. And that also will help in saving our reserves. Ladies and gentlemen, indeed, the concluded negotiations and the agreements reached are already bearing fruits. Ghana's 2027 bonds jumped to rank among the top performers in emerging markets after Monday's announcement. The price of debt due in March 2027 climbed to 52.69 cents on the dollar on the same day. A close at that level will be the highest since August 2022. And this is according to Bloomberg. We are expecting the performance to even get better and better in the weeks and months ahead. So whilst Ghana completed a comprehensive restructuring of our debts in record time, there have been too many costly delays suffered by both data countries and creditors. And we urge all stakeholders in the international debt architecture to work together to strengthen the common framework for faster and more effective debt resolution so we can improve on the prevailing international architecture for sovereign debt restructuring. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to use this moment to thank the bondholders for their constructive engagement and to extend our gratitude to our OCC co-chairs, China and France, for their leadership and support. Reaching an agreement with bondholders, with both the bondholders and the official creditors, demonstrate the confidence of the international community and financial markets in Ghana. The government of Ghana wants to deeply thank the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, our bilateral creditors, the private creditors, and their advisors, Rothschild and Co., and Oric, and our advisors, Lazard and Hogan Lovells, Global Sovereign Advisors, GSA Lee Bushit, and our strategic advisor, Algest, for their relentless efforts and commitment in the success of this important debt restructuring. I have a wonderful first-class team at the Ministry of Finance who did all this hard work in ensuring that we reach this agreement. This momentous period really is the period to commend them. They continue to show commitment, extreme commitment, and dedication to their work. And Ghana owes you gratitude. I want to thank you on behalf of Ghana for the great job you have done. Let me now turn to updates on the IPPs. As part of the implementation of the Energy Sector Recovery Program, government has for some time now been negotiating with the energy sector independent power producers to restructure legacy debts of over 1 billion United States dollars owed to the IPPs and also to restructure the power purchase agreements so we could address the accumulation of areas in the energy sector and work towards implementing critically needed reforms to make the sector more financially sustainable. A government negotiation team was mandated to restructure the legacy debt owed to the IPPs, namely AXA, Amandi, Senate, Send Power, Car Powership, Early Power, and Sunon Asogli. In addition, the negotiation team was tasked to finalize any outstanding matters pertaining to the restructuring of the respective power purchase agreements of the IPPs with the Electricity Company of Ghana. The key objective of the exercise was centered on the restructuring of the legacy debts, necessary amendment to the PPAs, and other project documents arising from the restructuring exercise, as well as ensuring that ECG remains current on its payment obligations to IPPs under the respective PPAs going forward. The final round of negotiations after several months of negotiations resulted in the following. Commercial agreements have been reached on headline debt restructuring terms and renegotiated power purchase agreement terms with the following companies. Amandi, Sand Power, Early Power, 
Senate, and AXA. We are finalizing documentation to sign this agreement this week and the next. The amended Amandi Send Power and LA Power documentation will require parliamentary approval. And the government negotiation team is pursuing an aggressive timeline aimed at securing various regulatory, ministerial, and other approvals prior to presentation of the amended documentation to parliament for approval before parliament rises at the end of July 2024. Work on closing out and executing the Sunong Asogli restructuring package and documentation is also in progress. ECG and GNPC have agreed all commercial terms under a master gas supply arrangement with final technical details being considered under which GNPC will sell to ECG fuel in bulk for onward supply to the IPPs as part of the conversion to a tolling arrangement. The master gas supply arrangements between ECG and GMPC are central to the restructuring exercise. The GNT is further engaging car powership to close out the car powership restructuring as soon as possible. I have read from the media yesterday the Chamber of IPPs disputing the accession of our concluded negotiation with the IPPs. And I'm sure that he wasn't well informed at the time the, the chamber issued the, the statement. I want to repeat that. We've reached agreement with Amandi, Sen Power, Eli Power, Senate, and AXA. We have seven IPPs, and we've reached agreement with five of them. That is very positive for our country. It tells us that the threats of shutting down power plants will be a thing of the past because we are committed to implementing this, the terms of this agreement. We already have started performing on our side. And to date, government has paid in excess of 400 million United States dollars to all IPPs as part of our performance of the agreement that we just reached. And therefore, for a chamber representing IPPs not to be informed about these developments and will issue a statement on behalf of the IPPs without consulting with them is really unfortunate. I hope that will be guided going forward because it is not in our interest to always go there with false information, with negative information. What for? What do we want to achieve? Should it not be in our interest as a country that government has worked tirelessly to reach agreement with IPPs? Is it not in our interest as a country? So why will a chamber representing IPPs go out there with such false information? It's not healthy for our country. It's not healthy for our development. For once, Let's see each other as partners in development and work together to develop our country for the benefit of our people. If we do not reach agreement with Asogli, does that amount to not reaching agreements with IPPs? Five out of seven? And the headline out there is that government lied. They did not reach agreement with IPPs. Why will government lie? What is our interest to, to, to lie to the people of Ghana? Same person, if you recall, put out false information that government owes IPPs $2 billion. And this information put out there misled the former president, Mahama, to repeat it in a tweet that he issued recently, blaming the Dumso for the $2 billion United States. When the IPPs know that, we've reconciled the debt areas with them, and it is about $1 billion United States dollars, which we have now reached an agreement to restructure. It's not healthy for our country. And therefore, I want to advise the chamber. I believe it is not the chamber. Maybe it's the CEO who is doing what he, he wants to do, not the chamber. If he spoke to AXA, he would have known that we reached agreement. If he spoke to Senate, he would have known that we reached agreement. Even in the case of Senpao and Amandi, the CEO in that statement 
said that we did not reach agreement with Twin City. And I'm surprised he doesn't even know that Twin City is the same as Amandi. And so the CEO will say that government reached agreement with Amandi, but did not reach agreement with Twin City in that statement. And I'm surprised. CEO of the chamber, you don't know that Amandi and Twin City is one company. So that is why I'm saying that the CEO may be doing his own things. But we are very positive minded and we know that we've reached a deal. It's good for Ghana. It's going to help avoid interruptions in power supply. It's going to help us to uh, continue to uh, fund the energy sector on a sustainable uh, uh, path. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, with all these developments so far, I am confident that our economy is certainly on the path of sustained recovery. And we will continue to work tirelessly to ensure sustainable growth and prosperity for all Ghanaians. The month of June 2024 is one to remember, ladies and gentlemen, with all the hard work coming together in the month. The verse in the Bible is, Chief. <laughs> Romans, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for, for the good. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, number one, I just want to reiterate points I made earlier. Number one, we've reached agreement with the official creditors, bilateral creditors, on the restructuring of $5.1 billion. This will lead to debt service relief of $2.8 billion between 2023 and 2026. We have also reached agreement with our Eurobond holders on the restructuring of $13.1 billion, which will lead to the cancellation of $4.7 billion of our debts and provide debt service relief of $4.4 billion between 2023-2026. The IMF Executive Board also approved our second review of Ghana's uh, program implementation last Friday, 28th June, 2024 and we are expecting disbursement of $360 million uh, today. And also, the strong recovery in the economy, evidenced by the strong growth of 4.7% in the first quarter of 2024, fueled largely by growth in industry. Ladies and gentlemen, you recall that I had indicated in my first monthly media update on the economy in March 2024 that the Minister of Finance will partner with academia to institute a quarterly economic roundtable as part of measures to promote accountability, transparency, and inclusiveness in economic governance. I'm happy to announce to you that the first quarterly economic roundtable will be held on the 2nd of July, 2024, that is tomorrow, from 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. It will be held at ISA, University of Ghana, on the team restoring macroeconomic stability. Now let me address the good people of Ghana. After all the data and the details that I have provided, I would like to state that we are in this together. If it is bad, it's bad for all of us. If it is good, it's good for all of us. Therefore, in this journey towards economic recovery and growth, we have faced challenges, but our resilience and determination have kept us strong. Let us continue to stand united in support of our government's efforts to steer our economy towards a brighter future. Let us build on the progress made so far with patience, and hope in our hearts. We are a nation of proud and resourceful people with a can-do spirit that has always propelled us forward 
and above many, many nations across the world. Together, we shall overcome the obstacles and emerge stronger as a nation, more united and more prosperous. Let us march forward with faith in ourselves, in our leaders, and in our beloved Ghana. We are Ghana, and together we shall rise again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and may God bless our country. Honorable Minister, our country representative from the IMF and the governor of the Central Bank, Bank of Ghana. On that note, Minister, I don't think I need to do any summary of your presentation. <laughs> I was enjoying the presentation. I said, oh, let me do a good summary for Minister. And then Minister started summarizing with his points. And then I said, what will you say? But in three, they asked that in the crack crack the same. And then the crack cry is that by close of work today, $360 million will hit Ghana's account after a successful review of second review of our IMF supported PCPEG program. And there is no better news than that. And I'm also excited about the fact that uh, government has been able to reach uh, agreement with five out of seven of the IPPs. Minister, energy issues are one of the issues that go to the core of every home. Rich of poor Ghanaians love our lights. So we acknowledge and commend your efforts to ensure that uh, challenges within the space, if it has to do with money, are duly resolved. Minister also mentioned, and let us take note, that the announcements of Ghana's debt to IPPs standing at $2 billion is false. The actual figure is around a billion, and this agreement will help uh, be, uh, the restructuring efforts between government and the IPPs. I'm also excited about the master gas agreement between GNPC and ECG, uh, so that the issue of gas supply uh, to IPPs, so that power generators are able to be consistent in giving us uh, power supply. Honorable Minister, uh, there is also no better news than hearing that the first quarter growth in our country was primarily driven by growth in industry. For a lay person like me, growth in industry means one thing, jobs for young Ghanaians. And I'm excited that it's not cosmetic. Growth in industry means they are expanding, there will be vacancies, they will create more jobs. But uh, I'm, I'm just so happy today. I, I, as I mentioned, it was just good news all over and i didn't even want to uh, summarize and even spoil your beautiful presentation but it's important that we've invited journalists here and they need to get the opportunity to ask questions i'm not expecting too many questions i can see the smiles on their faces but please if you have any question this is the best time to ask you show by hand and then um the beautiful lady will bring the microphone to you. You mention your name and affiliation and proceed to ask your question. But before we take the first question, once again, I would like to acknowledge our media partners. We are live on GTV, Joy News, Asasi Radio, Channel 1 TV, Ne2 TV, Movement TV, Kingdom FM Accra, and streaming on Facebook at Ministry of Information and Ministry of Finance. Ruth, if you also have any questions from those joining us online, uh, we, we can take one set of questions from online after this round. So please, your name and affiliation, please. Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Emmanuel Bruce, and I for the graphic communications. Um, my question goes to um, Stefan. Um, in the first quarter of the year, um, data released by the um, BOG indicated that um, revenues for the first quarter is doing badly than it was in the first quarter of 2023. And on the other hand, expenditure seems to be going. Expenditure moved from 4.9 to 5.5, while revenue dropped from 3.3 to 2.9. So I want to find out from Stefan if um, this raises any fiscal concerns for the IMF. And then my
Okay, question also goes to the Honorable um, Minister. Um, I know as part of the IMF program, like another component of it is um, settling the outstanding issues with the financial sector. Um, we know the President recently announced that they should release some 1.5 to pay customers of um, these financial institutions. But I want to find out there are still some financial institutions who are insolvent, but their licenses are yet to be revoked by either the Bank of Ghana or the Securities and Exchange Commission. So I want to find out what is the plan for such institutions and customers of such institutions. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Nano Yankra. I work with SRC Radio. My first question is to Stefan. Stefan, there are media reports suggesting that Ghana is the highest borrower from the IMF. Can you confirm that and how does that project the country? There are media reports. I saw it just last week. Uh, Minister, uh, I would like to find out from you, seeing as we are receiving this money and you're also preparing to uh, present a media budget review, should we expect a supplementary budget from you? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Justice Adubai. I write for the Shiva News Agency. Yes, congratulations, Minister. I saw Shiva News Agency. Yes. I saw the Hafiz trying to become a Bible scholar, and congratulations on that. Yes, I just want a clarification from the governor. When he spoke about the reserve accumulation, he mentioned um, $970 million. And we have $90 million. We, are, we want to know whether it is $9.7 billion or $907 million. We talk about reserve accumulation. Yes, thank you. For the questions, we'll go for responses and come back to you for another round. Okay, Stefan? Yes, so I, I will take the, the, the two, two questions here that I think were addressed to me. The first one is on fiscal performance year to date. Um, and in, in, indeed, the, the year has started relatively slowly in terms of revenue collection, but we understand. Uh, from the, the, the Ministry of Finance and based on, on data that we have received recently that things have improved significantly in the subsequent months. So we are not overly concerned by, by what we are seeing since the beginning of the year. Um, we will have an opportunity to discuss these numbers with, uh, with the Ministry of Finance and, and, and with the Central Bank uh, within 10 days. We will be in, in, uh, in Accra just for a short uh, a technical uh, uh, visit and that will be an opportunity for for us to engage with the, with, with the authorities on, on, on those numbers. Um, we, uh, there was a question um, about the, whether Ghana is the highest uh, borrower from the IMF. And the response, in, in a nutshell, is no. Uh, Ghana is not the highest uh, borrower from the IMF. And you can imagine, if you look overall, countries like uh, Argentina have a very, very, very large uh, program with, with the fund, and, and, and Ghana is not the is not borrowing as much. It is Ghana, however, is the largest borrower at the current juncture from our PRGT, the Poverty and uh, Poverty Reduction uh, Trust Fund, um, and that's because of the size of the uh, program, which is of uh, three billion US dollars. Okay, so Thank you, Honourable Minister. Um, we'll be providing details on the data during the mid-year budget. But just to satisfy the curiosity of my, my friend, um, let me read this for you. So provisional data for January to May 2024 showed that total revenue and grants at the end of the period amounted to 58.8 billion Ghana cities, 4.5% below the program target. Okay. And we are doing the media in July. So if you see June data, then you will notice that uh, revenue hasn't done bad. Although we want to do more, it hasn't done uh, bad. If you compare that with expenditure, total expenditures on commitment basis amounted to 84, 85 billion. And this is um, um, uh, something we are working at, but the preliminary figures we are seeing is that by the time we do the mid-year, 
we would have neutralized that as well. So that shouldn't be a, a bother for you. Okay. Honorable Fatima, we are in your hands. Honorable Minister, um, there was a question about whether or not you would present supplementary uh, budgets during the mid-year. Let me say that the, the funds we are receiving from the fund is for financing. If you look at the budget, you have revenue, you have financing, and you have also uh, uh, loans and, 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 and grants. So this is coming to support the financing, which has already been factored in the 2024 budget. So we are not doing... Uh, I don't want to announce that we are doing supplementary budget or not, <laughs> but <laughs> specific to that question, it is already captured. It's coming to support uh, uh, already budgeted programs and the uh, measures of the government. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I, I killed your headline. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable yeah. Minister. But the, the, the customers of liquidated financial institutions, yes, if you look at the budget, there was provision of about 4 billion Ghana cities to address the legacy challenges in the uh, financial sector. And part of this is what we are channeling into NIB to recapitalize NIB. And part is what we are using to uh, provide a bailout, bailout, I like to qualify that, to the customers of the liquidated uh, financial institutions. The, the amount standing in their name, their losses, I understand it's about $4 billion, Ghana cities, but this is bailout the government is providing. It is important we understand that government does not accept liability for the investment decisions of individuals and corporate entities. Government doesn't accept liability for that. And this is why we call it bailout. Government had earlier provided bailout, I think 50,000 per affected person. And what we are seeking to do is a second bailout because our government is sensitive to the plight of the affected people. As a Government, you don't say that because your citizens made mistakes or uh, they were not well informed and therefore they took investment decisions which have landed them into losses. You want to watch them suffer. What we have been told is that some have lost their lives as a result of this, some are really struggling. And so as a sensitive government, a responsible government, you will want to run to the help of, of your citizens. And this is why government has considered that we should provide a second bailout in order to reduce the burden, the, the, the difficulties they are, they are going through. And so uh, when we have more money in future, um, I don't know, uh, future governments may take decisions on what they want to do. But for now, government has decided that we provide additional bailout to the affected uh, persons. And so if you are mentioning all the others that have been affected, we are discussing all those, but government will take a decision at the right time, at the appropriate time, on, on what response to give to all of them together. I'm sure that's all for me. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Dr. Addison, there was a question um, for you, I think it was on accumulation of reserves, if you have any clarification on that. Yes, thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, before I go on that one, let me uh, bring a little clarity to uh, this issue on the legacy uh, problems in the financial sector. I believe what the Minister was speaking about, uh, the SEC regulated institutions that have been uh, sort of waiting for this bailout. But in addition to the SEC regulated institutions, you also have the SDIs, these are savings and loans, uh, microfinance institutions, finance houses, 
which are also in trouble. Uh, the long and short of it is that the uh, resources are not yet available. And as soon as the resources are made available, uh, we would have to deal with uh, depositors in that segment of, of the financial sector. Now, on the question on the reserves, uh, the level of gross reserves is 6.6 .6 billion US dollars. What I said was the accumulation of reserves on a year-to-date basis. From January to June 27th, the Bank of Ghana has 17 million. So that's additional uh, accumulation of reserves in 2024 alone. Obviously, depending on what happens in the second half of the year, and listening to the minister, you can see the challenges uh, that managing an economy entails. All of these uh, IPP payments, they have implications, uh, not only for the fiscal deficit, but they also have implications uh, for the balance of payments. And all of these... Uh, we are able to build for the entire year or whether we will be able to continue uh, with this pace of reserve accumulation in the second half of the year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor. Uh, I saw a hand behind me. We'll pick some questions from here as well. And then Echo will come back to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. My name is Paco Sosari. I work for Media General. Uh, TV3, to be specific. Um, I started with the, the governor. Um, so it's been almost eight years um, since the banking sector reform, or if you like. And um, I think so far only one individual I know has been prosecuted. Um, I know that you made a case for a number of uh, entities to be prosecuted because there were serious infractions by some of the directors and board members. What does it say of us, ATS, you know, into this, the fact that there's still people walking out there free and that we've, we're going to be spending um, another money as bill out uh, to customers? Mr. Minister, the second one is directed at you. So you talked about all the fantastic uh, macroeconomic figures we've witnessed. Uh, that's good on the side of government, but I'll tell you what the streets are saying. The exchange rate volatility is still very high, 18.4% from year to date. And of course, you know how that is impacting on businesses. Food prices continuously are rising. Cement prices, and of course, we all know the impact of cement prices on the general economy. And already, the minister responsible for trade is thinking about or considering legislation or price controls. Interest rates are very much high. The purchasing power of the individual continues to fall. In fact, a recent survey, as, as early as uh, April 2024, Paco, is interest you, rates. For the benefit of your colleagues, the preamble is very long, and they may not get the If you just allow me, I'm just, I'm just concluding. If you just allow me. I think that you should just allow me to finish. Interest rates, as per, well, I think about 10 countries that were surveyed, Ghana's interest rates were the highest, about 29%. How are you addressing this? Finally, Mr. Minister, um, I, I heard you it take... Um, please, please, please. I reserve the right to leave it at two questions. Kindly consider your colleagues so that they can also get to ask questions. Thank you very much, um, Minister. My name is Adam Kujo. I work with the EIB network, GH1 Star FM, to be precise. So my question is a direct one. When we look at the 2024 budget, we realize that there were some 17 billion cities um, that had been earmarked to service our external debt. In fact, it was 44 billion in all, 27 and uh, four local, and 17 for external. Now, considering this uh, negotiation that or restructuring that we have, we want to know first of all for this year how much savings are we making of 17 billion? What then would that savings be used for? Secondly, and finally, considering we are moving, we are restructured 
um, the, with the creditors, a three-year uh, moratorium, where we'll be paying. What plan are we putting in place to ensure that in three years' time we'll have enough resources to pay those debts once they are mature? Thank you. For the question, there was a lady at the back. I don't know if you still Please. want to ask. My name is Natalie Nettie. TFM and Channel One TV. Minister, please, I know you shut down the question on the supplementary budget, but I want to know priority areas we should be expecting on the budget. Just touch on a few for us. Thank you. Thank you for the question. There are some hands here. I want us to take them together so that after the re responses, they can give their conclusion. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. My name is Joshua I'm with the Business and Financial Times. So, um, we are last meeting. During our last meeting at New World, you gave the indication that the savings of which we're going to be making from the debt we have will be part of it will be sent into a second fund, um, and that cabinet will be deliberating on that. If you could give us an update with regards to that, uh, this will follow on the question from my colleague. Thank you for the question. Thank you. My name is Akko Moses. I correspond for Bloomberg. Um, when well, the approval of your deal with the bondholders, when do you expect to have the deal approved? Especially in what we say, um, compliant is that a deal? And two, sorry, my mic is moving. The approval. Okay, fine. Okay, I'm saying that. When are you having a deal with your bondholders approved by the official credit committee, especially in the spirit of competitive agreement? On the, you spoke about people speculating against the, the currency. There's a school of thought that there's also a school, people that also use that as a mode of money laundering. So here money um, in acquired worth is quickly being converted into dollars, not just as, as a store of value, but also because money had been um, laundered. What, what, what perhaps may you have to try and deal with that? Because here the foreign has become your know, number one suspected um, corporates. Finally, let's talk about the about bond exchange and the uh, non bond please, Let's leave it at two questions. Thank you. Yes, I stopped someone, so it's not fair to let you ask more than two. Your name and affiliation, and then proceed. Please, please from Ghanaian Times. I want to find out from the minister. In total, how much debt relief, uh, debt cancellation, are we receiving from the bilateral creditors and the euro bond? You mentioned some figures. If you can verify from us, you also mentioned debt relief. If you can explain the debt cancellation and debt relief, that will be fine. Then my second question goes to the governor. If you can tell us the sources of the accumulation of the reserves, nine hundred and seventeen million dollars. What are the sources? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the questions. I take that to be the last question, Honourable Minister. So, Governor, it's like you you you, you have few few questions. I have plenty to respond to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well. Um, Mr. Pagosi, I, I heard you cataloging the ills of the economy, problems, and uh, I, I just hope that you were not turning my press conference into a campaign platform. <laughs> you know, that, that is on the lighter side. But I think that, let me put this in proper perspective. All the data we have provided today, and that is how economics is when you want to do an analysis of the economy. All the data I have provided today is in relative to what existed before. So if you come and tell me that inflation is 23%, so inflation is high. True, you've said the, you've said the truth. But look at where inflation was, 54% by the end of 2022. And now it is the 
percent. You cannot tell me that there have not been serious efforts by government and by all stakeholders to bring it to that level. And that is why I was saying I hope you are not turning this into a political platform. Because if you go out there and say that, oh, inflation is high, 23%, 23%, the government is doing nothing, people are suffering. When you say that, then you are misinforming the public because you are not providing the context properly. And that is very important. Same as the exchange rate. We said that even though the city has come under pressure recently, compared to last year, the city has been relatively more stable because date, uh, year to date, it depreciated by just 18%. Last year, same time, it depreciated by 22%. So if somebody was on the market last year, same time, we are saying that the depreciation of the city at that time was more than it has depreciated, you know, year to date, from January to date. And so in relative term, you will see that there is a change. So if we were to, to um, equal the depreciation to suffering. It will mean that the suffering of the person today is lesser than the suffering of the person same time last year. And you cannot see that this is not as a result of the efforts of government. So I want us to understand economic analysis so that we don't just go out there and put out information without providing the context. When we do that, then we mislead the public. We misinform the public, and that is not healthy. And so for those of you who are reporters on the economy, it is important you put things in proper perspective. Otherwise, some may conclude that you are just saying things to make the government unpopular. Because you cannot pretend that there have not been progress significant progress. In fact, by the end of 2022, the depreciation was about 54%. So if we are now seeing a depreciation 18%, there is a significant effort that has brought us this far. And we cannot close our eyes to that. So that's what I will say on this, uh, my brother, uh, Fagwasi. The second question, 17 billion cities to serve external debt and also the restructuring of the, the, the debt, what plans to ensure we pay back? So uh, Mr. Akers will take uh, these questions on the uh, debt service. The savings that will be made will be put in a sinking fund as was proposed by us. Can you elaborate? I will take that one. The, where would the Eurobond holders, where would the agreement of the Eurobond holders be approved by OCC? I will take that one. How much debt cancellation and debt service we can you explain? Professor Akers will take that. So Akers, please. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Um, I think for the question, um, the I'll, I'll define the terms of your appointment. <laughs> <laughs> I am honest, sir. <laughs> I think instead of seven, I think it was 19 for external debt interest and then 20 for amortization external. And as you, if you remember, in 2023 budget, at the time we did the budget originally, before we went into the financing assurances, in the media review, an amount of 13 billion was hiked off from total debt service in the budget. So again, at the time 2024 budget was done, we had not completed what you had all heard now. So it was impossible for anybody to precisely forecast how much that amount will be. So in the media review budget, you will see the actuals based on what has happened now under the interest and then the amortization. Um, in some bit, it may either go up or it may come down because there's also disbursements that also has some increase on that. So for now, just wait for the media budget and then pay attention to those details. On the other side, the question was on debt relief. 
and what does that uh, mean and in terms of the numbers that we have in. And that term, knowledge you've, you've asked, is a technical one. And I will explain it in simple terms that relief is relief. If you have a headache and you take paracetamol and the headache goes, that is a, a relief. Maybe it's for malaria and you have to take the other components for three more days. But the relief from the headache will have gone, but then the problem goes into a little bit into the other side. So this relief operates a bit in that, but with all the dimensions. One, on debt, there's a relief on interest payment, and I think the Rob Minister mentioned that. With regards to the Euro Bond 1, we have interest payment complete reduction by $4.4 billion for the period 2023 to 2026. It's not the period of the entire life of the bonds. So what it means is that the entire life, it will even be larger. But what is happening is that because you have the IMF program from 2023 to 2026, we are giving you the relief that you will be seeing in the budget that will not have to be paid for in that period. That's the first one. And when you come to the debt stock itself, there's also other relief there, but in this case, the 37% nominal haircut gives you a complete cancellation, which means the amortization, that's the figure he mentioned, the 20 billion on the other side, will not be paid at all. And that is a $4.7 billion. So now you see one that is coming in on the annual budget for that four years, and one that is on the entire debt stock that will not come in. That is for the Euro bond side. Now let's move from there to the official creditor committee. They're, they're using a system that has inherited the debt service suspension initiative. So what does it say? Service suspension. So you are suspending. That is still a relief because you don't have to create funding to pay for it now. So you are suspending an amount of $2.8 billion, which you have accumulated for 2023 to 2026. Now, that also is the same period for the IMF program into a later date where the economy will be stronger, as you have, Honorable Minister. Recording and in progress. And it will be an ease in terms of the ability to go. So the relief has appeared on these three dimensions as regards to the external side. Honorable Minister, I think that, that, is, that is okay for now. Stefan Stefan will leave us for a meeting. You want to take his closing remarks? Yes, Okay. So, Mr. Stefan Rode, if you are ready, if you can hear me, we will take your concluding remarks and then come back to the Q&A session. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. I don't, I don't think there was any question last said for our, for me. I just want to end on, on a message of uh, hope, hope and optimism. Um, uh, it's, like the minister said, is inflation too high? Yes, it is too high. Is, uh, can we understand the frustration of uh, Ghanaians when the currency depreciates? Yes, we, I think we, we collectively we, we, we all do, but, but I think what is important is to remember where we're coming from. We're coming from a very deep, a very painful crisis in 2022, and what has been achieved thus far is quite, quite remarkable. And so what is important is the direction of travel. Things are improving, the fiscal and external positions are improving, inflation is decreasing, growth is increasing, everything is going in the right uh, direction. And certainly provided the program continues to be implemented, provided uh, the government um, uh, keeps implementing the PCPEG reforms, um, I am very optimistic that things will continue to improve and, and that Ghana is on the right track. Uh, I am pretty optimistic that the Ghanaians will uh, see the, and, uh, and, and benefit from the fruits of these uh, reforms and continue to do so in the, in the month and in the years ahead. So that's, that's what I want to uh, uh, end with, uh, uh, Honorable Minister and, 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 and Governor. And we thank you and your team for the great work you are, you are doing uh, with us. We expect him to receive you, uh, I think, about a week or, or, or two to continue our collaboration. Uh, we thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Then I'll take the last question. I, I could you answer how much debt cancellation? You've, you've done that. 
Okay, so I will work, I will, I will speak to the sinking fund issue. I mean, this was a proposal we made uh, when I addressed you, the media, after we reached agreement with the OCC. But it is important we understand this. The savings and the cancellation is not bringing us physical cash. We know that. They are not going to give us physical cash. What we would have paid, we will not pay. So it is not physical cash that you will take and go and put in a fund, you know, and when it is time for you to repay, then you take it and repay. Far from that. But what we are saying is that, uh, and these are proposals we are discussing, like the hippic era, where debt service was budgeted for, and that amount put into a special account to do projects that we call hippic projects, is one way of handling that. The other way of handling it is that we already have a sinking fund. And so with the economy growing and revenue increasing, you could do allocation specifically uh, to the sinking fund to increase your debt repayment capacity uh, in, in future. The, there are other reforms that we could implement to source funding for the sinking fund. For example, with, with improved financial management of state enterprises, government would decide that the dividends paid by the state enterprises should go to the sinking fund also to build the buffers that we need. So what we're trying to say is that we need to build buffers. Even though we are not going to pay this money, we need to build buffers in readiness to repay so that when it's time, when it's due, that it is easier for us to, to repay. And, and that, I, I think, explains the, the issue about the, the sinking fund. I've, I've listened to a colleague of mine in Parliament who is saying that we should set up a sinking fund and put you know, part of the money we are saving. But really, it is not money coming in physical terms. We are savings, we will not pay it, but we could deliberately still budget for debt service. However, we commit that to uh, future uh, repayment. We could also do projects like we did for HIPIC. Use it to do projects. You can call this one, uh, do you want to call it Eurobond projects or OCC projects? We can find a convenient uh, term for, for that. But these are just proposals, and government really uh, will look into all these proposals and take a decision on the best way forward to uh, making the best use of the savings that uh, we, are, we are making from this debt restructuring. So I thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question for Dr. Addison. So, <coughs> Governor, if you Yes, thank you uh, very much, Minister. The question on the banking sector reform, I mean, this could take us a, a whole day if we want to discuss that subject. Uh, matter of and I think that you are right. Uh, the issues of the accountability of the shareholders who run down these banks—it's an important uh, matter. Uh, we are a country where the rule of law uh, prevails. I know that there are over seventy cases of uh, financial sector issues in the courts. Some of them are civil. Some of them are criminal. Uh, the receiver is also trying to re retrieve assets. And it's taken a really long time to, to really bring all of these matters uh, to, to a close. But it's important that the, the state needs to persevere and, and, and pursue these shareholders who have misappropriated depositor funds. Uh, the large amounts of money that we claim was used uh, to clean up the financial sector some of these monies are being held in assets by the shareholders. And, and I think that the, the law needs to, to be allowed to, to, to do its work. Uh, we know that it, the wheels of justice grind slowly, but hopefully we, all of these matters will be brought. Of what contributed to the foreign exchange reserves uh, on a year-to-date basis. You know that we have received monies uh, from the IMF early in January. That certainly was part of it. You also know we've received monies from the World Bank. That is part of it. 
And then, as I said, the biggest source of resources for us has been uh, the Gold for Reserves program, which has uh, brought in a lot of uh, foreign exchange uh, to the Bank of Ghana's uh, reserve accounts. So these are some of the different sources of, of the reserve uh, build up for the first half of the year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Addison. We will take your concluding remarks and then take Minister's concluding remarks and draw the curtain on today's presser. So, Doc, if you have any final comments. Final comments, yes, we have made a lot of progress in the year so far. We acknowledge that we still have a lot of work to do between now and the end of the year. And there are many challenges, but we are confident and we are committed uh, to implement the policies to the letter, which would allow us to meet the end of year targets uh, that we have set for ourselves. And with the support of all of you and Canadians, we are hopeful that we would end, you know, 2024 on a very strong note. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Addison. You heard from the governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison. On that note, Minister, I will yield to you for your final remarks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the circumstances we found ourselves in and the time of COVID, compounded by the global challenges associated with the war in Ukraine, were circumstances beyond the control of the world. Many countries, as of today, have not recovered. Some advanced countries are still in recession. And if you recall, our president said at the time that we know how to bring the economy back, but we do not know how to bring lives back. If you look at the economy of Ghana at the time and today, you compare it with what is happening today, our president has been vindicated because the economy has come around, the economy has come back. To record a growth rate of 4.7% in the first quarter that we haven't done since 2020, manufacturing that has been negative for many of the years, now turning positive 2%, and industry as a whole growing by 6.8%. It's remarkable. The macro fundamentals have come around inflation going down from 54% to 23%. The depreciation of the city, you know, going down from 54% to 18% uh, year to date, 22% last year, and from February last year to uh, December, about 8, 9, 9%. The fiscals have been contained to the extent that we are making primary surplus this year of 0.5% coming from a deficit. So if you sum up all the data relating to the performance of the economy at the time of COVID and now, then you will see the effort that has gone into turning the economy around. We admit that there are still challenges. We admit that we cannot bring everything to the end at a goal. It has to be systematic. It has to be perseverance. But also, it will require patience. And this, I call on the people of Ghana to continue to exercise that patience and to work with us to continue to make the progress that we are making. I believe that we will build a stronger economy and the people of Ghana will benefit. They will see the benefit. They will see real development in your communities across the country. But we cannot do this alone as a government. It will have to take all of us as a country, as a people, sailing in the same ship 
to the destination that we desire for our country. And when we get there, we will all rejoice together. And this is why I said earlier, if it is bad, it's bad for all of us. If it is good, it's good for us. Now we all can see hope. The future is brighter. We have come out of the crisis. What we are trying to do now is to build the steps to bring our economy to the pre-COVID period, where we had single inflation, where we were growing at average 8%. We will get there with patience. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Thank you so much, Governor of the Bank of Ghana. That brings us to the end of today's press briefing. But before we draw the curtain once again, permit me to acknowledge our media partners. A special thanks to all reporters, journalists, and technical men who joined us this afternoon for today's press briefing. I would also like to acknowledge all the radio and TV stations that picked today's briefing live. GTV, Joy News, Asasi Radio, Channel 1 TV, Netu TV, Movement TV, Kingdom FM Accra, and our social media teams who are streaming on Facebook at Ministry of Information and Ministry of Finance. Uh, I will yield to Ms. Ruth Botu. She has uh, a list of dignitaries from Ministry of Finance and Bank of Ghana so that they will be duly acknowledged. Thank you, Honorable. Um, we acknowledge the presence of everyone here standing on existing protocols. Thank you to Governor and Stefan for joining us, the Honorable Minister. Commissioner General GRE, thank you for your unflinching support. Um, Honorable Minister of State, Honorable Deputy Ministers, thank you. To Deputy Governor Maxwell, we thank you for your presence. And the directors of the B um, from the Bank of Ghana, we cannot mention you all by name, but thank you for joining us. Our indomitable Chief Director, Madam Eva Mens, Coordinating Director, Madam Stella, and all directors of the ministry, thank you for your presence and your support for the minister as always. We will close with a closing prayer from Dr. Alassane Idrisu, who's the director in charge of the Economic Strategy and Research Division. Thank you. Dr. Alassane. Let's pray. Thanks for tuning in to the live press conference from the Ministry of Finance. Briefly, what they touched on was that 360 million US dollars from the IMF money will hit the Bank of Ghana account by the end of the working day today, bringing the total funds received from the IMF to 1.6 billion US dollars, um, which means that it's just left with one more tranche. They have also reached an agreement with five out of seven independent power producers Users, which will assure that the country receives stable power supply. Many thanks for watching. Keep watching Channel 1 TV.